to uh, say, first of all, how welcome I feel and have always felt at Parkview United Church. Um, you are the welcoming church, it's uh, very definitely true. And uh, it's an honor to, to count this as my home church. So it's, uh, it's great to be here this morning. And I wanted to, to take the opportunity to give you an update on the progress I've been making as a student minister, as a preacher, and also to talk about um, something, some of the things I've observed, the experiences I've had within the church, uh, in the Huron Perth Presbytery, um, in over the last three or four years, and uh, just to talk and relate this loosely to the uh, lectionary readings that we heard this morning, okay? Um, and I wanted to begin by saying that uh, I guess the last three years have been a joy. I've really enjoyed almost every moment of it. It's been a lot of fun. It's not been easy. There's been some real challenges along the way. In fact, I'm only just beginning to attend Emmanuel College full-time come this fall. God willing, I will attend it because I haven't actually said in writing yet that I'm attending. But, all the paperwork's filed and everything, and we're prayerful that the uh, outcome will be positive. So I'm, I'm looking forward to studying at Emmanuel College. Obviously, I'm looking forward to a career at the end of that time. And uh, recently, I have uh, been appointed as a student minister or a recognized candidate quarter time at Hensley United Church. And that is a, a great honor to, to uh, be at Hensel. If you'd like to see some of my uh, sermons from Hensel, you can go on my website, which is ianoneal.org. Okay, you can find the spelling of my name in the uh, bulletin this morning. Uh, the website is in beta at the moment, which means it's in the test format. Okay, but uh, you can uh, get a sense of what I've been uh, talking about by clicking on the sermons portion. It is actually now functioning, and you can. Um, watch some of those sermons. I have uh, also been the student minister at Forest United Church for about 18 months. And we began in Forest with three children in Sunday school. That's why they hired me, because they were having trouble attracting young people to the church. It's not easy in 2012 to at attract young people to church, to church of any kind. Okay? Well, we're doing a few, one groundbreaking project at the moment, which has seen some considerable success, and that is what I call it Monday school. It's actually called Fun After School. We've taken the Sunday school program to the local public school and we're teaching that Sunday school at the end of school uh, at the local public school. We went from three kids enrolled to 27 children enrolled in that particular program, the after school program. And we kind of realized that, wow, this is worth looking into. It's a, a test program. Uh, it's not been without its challenges. However, I think that as the word gets out that these kinds of services are available, I think more and more families will be responsive. And it speaks to one thing. It speaks to the fact that the church in 2012 has to be willing to be flexible, to look at new ideas, and to meet the people where they are in life. Now, when I, have, um, I have went for a walk around Hensel United Church, it's a big church, okay, quite big, almost as big as Parkview, it's, well, not quite, but it's getting there. 
That's a smaller community. But I noticed a picture on the wall of the 1986 graduating class of uh, the Sunday School at Hensel United Church. 65 children in that picture. Today we have zero. There are no children. There. I preached at, I think it's at least 50 different churches in and around the presbytery in the last three years. And most of the churches I preach at are less than half full, sometimes less than a quarter full. I don't know if that speaks to the, how popular I am or not, but hopefully it's not the fact that I'm not popular. But still, you know what I'm talking about. This church happens to be an exception, and I'm deeply thankful for that. I'm deeply thankful. But, you know, I have a concern. And that is, okay, I'm, I've got at least four years yet before I can work full time as a minister. And I'd like to think that there will be a job waiting for me in four years. A calling waiting for me. It's not really a job, but a calling at a church that will be able to pay me a full time wage because I'm not a wealthy person. Okay. And judging from what I've seen in churches from here to the lake, I wonder sometimes how long they're going to be there. Honestly, I do. Now, I am not here this morning to point fingers. Okay? One thing I noticed, somebody told me actually, so, you know, when you point a finger, there's at least three fingers pointing back at you. Right? It's really nobody's fault. It is a sign of the times. The changing times in which we live. The changing attitudes. Many of which I appreciate, understand, and identify with among the general public about the Christian church. It's about many things. I'm not here to pro propose or present solutions this morning. I'm here to serve the Lord to hopefully, God willing, to just help you along in your faith, as I think each and every sermon is supposed to do. It brings me to a story reminds me of a story um, about the great violinist Itzhak Perlman. He is a virtuoso. He is, he plays the Stradivarius from 1715. He's one of the very few people in the world that are allowed to play that instrument. And he's world famous. Many of you, I'm sure, know him or know of him. He first got his start at age 12 or 13 with the American public and the Canadian public um, through the, uh, uh, the television uh, program um, in 1958, I believe, when it was first nationally televised. Um, and since then has been uh, well known throughout much of the world. He played Lincoln Center on November 18th, 1995. And if you play Lincoln Center, uh, you know your jobs. Okay. Um, he is also, he, was, he contracted polio at an early age, five, six years old. So he doesn't walk too well. All right? He's got braces on both legs. And so the audience expectant audience uh, listening the great man is walking out on stage walks out on stage slowly sits down, moves each leg 
sets it in just the right place, and then picks up his violin and begins to play. Nods to the conductor, the conductor begins, and they begin to play. And suddenly, almost like a gunshot, throughout the whole auditorium, boom, everybody knew what had happened. A string broken on the violin. And Marco, you, uh, I'm sure you, you know that uh, anybody that's a musician knows that it's absolutely 100% impossible to play in a symphony with a violin with only three strings. What was the great man going to do? This was disappointing. This was tough. I mean, okay, are we going to wait for him to walk off the stage, get another violin? I don't know if he was playing the Stradivarius that night, but we've got to think that this is a pretty unique violin that he's playing. Is he going to get another one? And is he going to get it re-strung? The one he's playing, is he going to re-spring it on stage? Is something going to come out? It was, you know, there was logistics involved. In it. He closed his eyes. He seemed to gather his strength. And then he opened his eyes again, and he looked at the conductor, and he nodded to the conductor to begin. And he began to play with three strings. And it seemed to the audience, those that were there, and the person that wrote about this particular event, it seemed to that person that he was the Perlman was, during the course of his playing, was searching for and reaching new notes that he didn't know he had. That he was retuning the violin as he played in order to be in tune, in order to express one of the greatest renditions of that symphony that the audience had ever heard. And at the end, of that particular performance. There was an uh, awesome hush in the crowd, and then suddenly they were on their feet applauding and cheering. And Perlman was very humble. And he said words to the effect, you know, sometimes it is the artist's task to find out what music you can make with what you have left. I think that speaks well to the human condition. We heard this morning the Apostle Paul writing about how he had a thorn in his flesh, how he was far from perfect. In 1 Corinthians, generally, he puts, lays down his credentials as an apostle, and he says, does he say that I'm in line to be the mayor of Corinth? Does he say that I know Caesar? No. He says, I've been whipped, I've been persecuted, I've been forgotten. These are my credentials. This church has been suffering, <coughs> suffering great losses. And yet, we are called to play a symphony. This is how God, I am sure, would like it to be. It may sound counterintuitive for me to say that. But I believe that we are capable of meeting the challenge. Of meeting the people where they are. And experiencing some real spiritual growth, not only in our church, but outside the walls of the church, because God knows we need it. No. Not just 
we who are sitting here, but on our society, needs it. We need hope. We need to believe that there is a future. We need to believe that there is something worth believing in. So I'll leave these thoughts with you this morning. And remember Perlman. And remember the miracles of God that not only are possible but are expected. In Jesus' name. God bless you all.